Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast Record Club, where we talk about an album that is either a classic record or a forgotten album or something that we find interesting, worthy of its own video. And I'm here today with regular guest and friend of the podcast, Jacob, to talk about a band that is very special to him, a band that means a lot and is a band that we've never talked about on the Jams and Tea Podcast proper. I don't know if it's a band that Jake or Morgan would be all that into. And it's a band that I have, you know, I like this band. Their mileage so far for me is a little bit sort of, uh, I appreciate more than I outright enjoy. But there is one exception to that, which is the album we're going to be talking about today, 1988's Lincoln, uh, which I think is a great record. It's the album that kind of fully won me over onto like, okay, I get what this band is. I get what they do. And I think that this is just a really front to back, excellent set of songs. Uh, it's one of their most beloved and celebrated albums as well. So it made sense for us yeah. as a record club pick. And well, Jacob, I mean, I don't think that I could possibly give a better introduction to who this band are and why this album is so important, both for the band and to you personally so i'm going to throw over to you at this point who are they might be giants and what do we need to know about lincoln and dive into it from there if you want to they might be giants are an alternative rock band uh formed in new york city in 1982 started by the childhood friends of john Linnell and john flansburg they uh would often play play music together in high school but they had different ambitions after high school John Flansburg went to art college and Linnell went to college, dropped out, but eventually moved to New York City to participate in the local art rock and punk scenes after several bands that just went nowhere. Both uh, both of the Johns would later meet up and eventually form They Might Be Giants in 1982. Uh, they started to gain a lot of traction in New York City, uh, particularly through their live performances. They would write these like very weird very catchy one to two minute songs, stuff like Big Big Whoredom or Penguin or Cowtown, uh, these like very early songs that would eventually uh, track on their demo tape. And their live shows were interesting because it would just be two guys, it would just be those two guys, a drum machine, Flansburg would be on the guitar and Linnell would be on the accordion. And they would just do crazy shit and sing about these crazy songs or just randomly pull out a Frank Sinatra cover. And they became this very beloved band uh, in the art rock and punk scenes as a result. And uh, like certain songs, they would just bring out these random instruments like Linnell would carry a big bassoon or like on Lie Still Low Bottle, which is on this record, Flansburg would keep percussion just with a big stick. Like he would just thump a giant stick and that would be the, uh, <laughs> that would that would keep time for the entire song. And um, their demo tape got a lot of traction uh, but around the time they couldn't really form their their first, they couldn't record their first studio album until a little while after because of a bike injury that, um, or, or a hand injury that Linnell had taken while he was riding his bike. And so they started to uh, develop this process called dial a song, which is what really started to expand their fan base across the country. Like going from this little tiny cult band in New York City to starting to get traction across America. So dial a song, what it was, was they would record these lo-fi songs at home, some of which would eventually appear on eventual They Might Be Giants albums or would just be like fun little throwaway 30 second tracks like uh, on home so you could listen to it and there would be a brand new song every day. And that's what helped gain their traction. And uh, honestly, in some, in some aspects, it predates music streaming. And often I think that's why there are no remastered versions of these records because already they had to figure out how to expand these like tiny, tiny songs that would only f fit through uh, the speaker of a phone versus a, a, uh, they could expand that sound onto a giant speaker or your headphones or whatnot. So everything from uh, the first record on would sound very full and very rich. Mm. It's interesting because it is this, particularly at this point in time we're talking about, this is their second album um, following mm. up on their self-titled debut, but still very much in this kind of early period where you obviously, they're obviously a band that have access to a studio that have access to really quality recording material and they're using technology that's very much of its time. So it has this combination of very sort of lo-fi aesthetics and very kind of primitive style, but also it is clearly recorded well and it shows a band that 
are clearly very practiced and also have honed their mm-hmm. compositional craft to a certain extent to make these songs feel very refined and sharpened and kind of to the point uh, in a way that I think belies any of the kind of amateurish sort of throwaway feeling that maybe some of their early work or the dial of song experiment might have given uh it's interesting Mm -hmm. how that very kind of kitschy and direct and you know sort of straight to tape aesthetic that that is such a big part of early they might be giants is definitely much definitely very much intact here but also like complemented by these arrangements that tend to be a little bit more fulsome uh, even though a lot of the time they're working with you know maybe one or two instruments whatever they can bring into the studio uh to yeah. play one or two little lines and using you know drum machines as well the alessis hr16 drum machine is a huge part mm-hmm. of the sort of drum sounds on this album yeah. plus you have the akai s1000 sampler which is very yeah. huge like piece of 80s technology and would go on to be very influential in hip hop production, that sort of thing as well. That's used here as well on all of these songs to, you know, basically synthesize or to create a bedrock of sounds that the Johns will essentially riff on top of or build their songs on top of. So yeah, you have this very sort of DIY chintzy kind of aesthetic that is certainly pretty dated to the late 80s but also you have these songs that sort of just jump out from that and are so varied and colorful and they you know at certain points you get a sh- get shades of the kind of novelty aspects that their songs and their songwriting kind of originated in as well but there's just this sure. extra thread of I don't want to say something as lame as depth, but just like there's this extra thread of complexity in a lot of these arrangements and in a lot of these songs themselves that really show how confident these guys have become and how they're starting to kind of stretch their, you know, stretch, uh, flex their muscles and be a little bit more ambitious with what these very straightforward songs can actually be. I think you get a lot of, of examples of that on this album. It comes from two guys who are very influenced, who count in equal influence, a lot of the 60s pop that they grew up on. So acts like the Zombies and the Beatles, but as well as the experimental acts of artists like Frank Zappa and The Residents, where they could just like, you know, combine different genres just in one, like uh, make everything as weird as possible just in 30 seconds. But an also important influence on these guys was like 60s novelty jingles, because like um, it feels like every song off of their early records, and this will continue further and further in their career, but it sounds like they had a hook or like an, a melody just kind of floating around. And then they would just expand on that with like either this more pop field direction or this more like kind of weird, maybe experimental is a little overused of a word, but but like a, some of like the weird little interludes on the self-titled, for instance, like mm-hmm. there's a hook there, but it, again, like the, the, the track only lasts for like 30 seconds yeah. or like, um, like there's a synth sound which sounds very off kilter or whatnot yeah. and that's what i love about that first record admittedly but mm-hmm. lincoln you are right they do kind of like a, like because the, the first record had don't let's start which is a very like a like that's the song that basically kind of puts them on the map in terms of mtv and a lot of alternative rock radio as well as the music videos of adam bernstein who uh, was a was a key factor in a lot of alternative videos in the 80s and the 90s. He would later direct videos for Ween. He uh, his most famous video is uh, "Baby Got Back" by Sir Mix a Lot, which is a hilarious, fun video. So he brings like that sort of like artsy aesthetics to like the pop and rap videos that he would later direct. Mm-hmm. But he started out making music videos for They Might Be Giants, which only had a budget of like $5, but had these very unique ideas. Or something like Anna Eng, for instance, it's felt like, a, which is the lead single off of Lincoln, was filmed at like, you know, the New York World's Fair and like had used these like very weird expressionist camera angles and close ups to really give the feeling of like these, the off kilter nature of this band. Yeah, absolutely. I think you can't really talk about Lincoln without talking about the music videos, or at least mentioning the music videos, at least mentioning the kind of peripheral media, the way that 
they might be giants kind of expanded and showcase their very idiosyncratic style in that multimedia fashion as well. I think that the there's a lot of charm to videos for songs like Anna Ang and They'll Need a Crane and Purple Toupee, yeah. for instance, that, that really shows how much, I guess, sort of color and vibrancy and just raw creative energy is thro- flowing through these guys, you know, and, and the sheer pace of what they do is so dizzying but also at the same time so confidently executed that you are kind of just beguiled by it and you're pulled into it um lincoln i think is a a really great sort of satisfying front to back record experience because like you say the johns they'll write a song or they'll start with a hook and they will take it as far as they think is interesting and sometimes Mm -hmm. that means taking it not very far at all and kind of just letting it be this very very short punchy kind of almost jokey thing and sometimes it means really fleshing it out and adding multiple verses and sometimes adding bridges and and these and you know changing the structure of the song as it goes on as well and lincoln gives you a good dose of both of those styles of songwriting without either of them really pushing beyond the strengths of the Johns or overstaying their welcome or feeling a little bit too thrown away. Like some of the songs on the debut or on a record like flood can feel at certain points. There's such a great balance on this album that feels like every step of the way with a couple of exceptions, but I don't think there's anything here that I would call bad, but still every step of the way they're basically hitting their marks and they're doing something that feels very, captivating and feels very exciting and feels very original i don't think there's any two songs on this record that kind of repeat the same gimmick or do the same thing or feel as though they're pulling from the exact same place musically they are so creative and so disparate but at the same time unified by the aesthetic of they might be giants and by the very recognizable voices of linnell and flansburg i mean oh yeah you can't start anywhere with this album other than Anna Ang. It's such a huge song. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, it's one of the, you know, along with Don't Let's Start and Birdhouse in Your Soul, it's probably one of the top three biggest, most definitive uh, They Might Be Giant songs. Uh, it's certainly my favorite one that I've heard. It's just, you, you get kind of beaten down. It's so funny the way this album starts. You get, you kind of, you get beaten in by one of the most like heavy riffs, quote unquote, on the album. It's certainly a, such a loud sort of staccato thing that comes in but it's like this beautiful moment where it's this like it is this loud riff but it's also like done in this very staccato kind of like keyboardy sort of like electronic kind of way that makes it feel very sort of like you know inorganic and it's so that's such a perfect way of starting a they might be giants record which is this fusion of very sort of like you know earthy and real and recognizably human uh, aesthetics and instrumentation all that sort of stuff but completely filtered through and complemented by this weird zany world of you know samples of drum machines of you know weird voices of bizarre lyrics and all yeah. that sort of thing you just have this beautiful like melting pot of everything that makes up they might be giants and it's just comp- and it's all anchored by this really compelling central idea for what the song is about yeah. as well I full disclosure, Anna Ang is my favorite song of all time. Like I feel like I, I feel like uh, saying Anna Ang is my favorite They Might Be Giant song is such a, is a very like especially because I've gone through every single one of their records. I've seen them live. I've like, you know, I've made friends based off of like, you know, our mutual love of this band. So like I know people who will tell you that like you know, like their 2000 stuff is their best or like, you know, the deep, this deep cut off of their demo tape is the best. And yet every time I hear and like Anna Ang is just such a compelling song to me. It wasn't the first They Might Be Giant song I ever heard, but it was a song that like the minute I heard it, I was just so compelled. One of my favorite aspects about They Might Be Giants or maybe my favorite aspect is the lyricism. Whether it comes from Lamel or Flansburg, they just know how to captivate you with such prose and such detail. Like uh, I've seen several debates as to what Anna Eng is about based off of like, you know, the Cold War imagery in the video. Some people have said that it's about an American spy that falls in love with a Vietnamese spy. I've heard interpretations that it's about two people trying to meet at the New York City World's Fair, but things just keep going horribly. But 
to me, this is a song about like at its most basic core about a long distance relationship that is absolutely falling apart. Yeah. And I'm a sucker for a good breakup song. And honestly, Blinken, I would call in, in some aspects a breakup album, but the way it starts, you know, make a hole with a gun perpendicular to the way that, oh, that, God. that <laughs> opening verse, that, op- that opening verse is so great because it's like, it's, it's so, so disorienting good. and the way that the, the verse itself is constructed, but ultimately what it does, is it really conveys like, quite a potent image as well. First of all, I, uh, emphasizing the distance between these two people as well. Like they're on literal yeah. antipodes of the world, like literally like she's on the exact opposite side of the world to where he is. Um, but also yeah. like the, you know, the, the scatter shot and uncertain nature of their relationship is, you know, you already get a sense of that through how disorienting the construction of the the verses are how quickly the lines are delivered as well how almost kind of free associative it can feel at certain points as well when you get into deeper verses in the song as well the lines themselves seem to have not always a very clear relationship to what immediately proceeds or succeeds it there's images there's ideas no wonder it's so difficult to uh, clearly interpret but then you just get that anchor of the chorus itself which continues to come back as well and obviously changes and slightly shifts in perspective as time passes but it's it's just it's so absolutely addictive and you know there's a you get an immediate emotional connection there to the song that you don't always get immediately with they might be giant songs when the irreverence comes ahead of the humanity which doesn't always but it does sometimes that's the thing that is a good point i just that's what what i found out about they might be giants here listening to as much records as as i can from that or listening to all their records and listening to as much as i can from this band I think their lyrics, I think, are incredibly human, especially as you go further into the record. But Anna Ang, to me, especially like uh, once you get to that chorus, the listen, Anna, hear my words. They're the ones that I could say if there was a me for you, just, you know, like some people. And again, there's the interpretation that Anna Ang may not even exist, that this is just about a lonely man hoping that one day he can meet somebody on the other side of the world or like that this is like or eventually have that sort of romantic ideal of a long distance relationship and i don't know just every single element of the song i can barely explain it it just works for me musically uh again that staccato guitar the way the bass just like kind of kicks even though i know it's a synth bass they're just doing such interesting lot interesting things with that bass line yeah and uh again i love that drum uh god it's 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 so perfect it's it's everything they might be giants in one song like and yeah yeah, it sounds chintzy and it sounds obviously like it's being made with samplers and drum machines but that's part of the charm that's part of and it really you know every aspect of the limitations of what they might be giants are able to do is simultaneously a strength of their whole artistic identity and and in a song like this as well it only works to serve the the narrative and the feelings and the sense of sort of futility and confusion that the song is communicating like it's perfect and what i love about they might be giants and and linnell and uh, flansburg's writers but particularly linnell is that he's able to like that the the run-on nature of the the vocal deliveries as well you don't immediately pick up on how devastating and hard-hitting and well-constructed the lyrics are because they can sometimes yeah. sound as though he's just kind of speaking to fit the, the rhythm of the song and then moving on to something else like the way he says what there was in me for you and it just keeps going on you don't quite register what has being said immediately because there's such a yeah, fast pace and he doesn't necessarily go out of his way to add sort of melodrama or emphasis to emotional moments. I love that. I love when artists deliver these really devastating lines, but they don't play the emotion. They don't necessarily like, you know, uh, cue you into the devastation in those words or whatever. You figure it out by processing what you've just heard, but it's not like, you know, overly dramatized or pushed in your face and Linnell in particular but Flansburg too they're both great at delivering these lyrics that you don't you might miss how much is there if you're not like paying attention but it rewards the people like you know the fans or the people who are really into the songwriting who go back and actually pick these lines apart or pay attention to what's being said 
there's so many lyrics across the entire record that have been like that for me where the first time I heard it I had to actively be processing what was being said to really like Mm -hmm. you know take it in and it and it rewards you for that it consistently rewards you for that even in songs where they're just being silly or and where (laughs) the the no you know uh obvious tangible kind of emotional through line is is revealing itself immediately and that's fine by the way it's absolutely fine to do a song that is just about being silly and yeah but and but but like you can get more out of even the silly songs by taking the time to really kind of process the wordplay but also just the the choice of how these lines are constructed and how the images that uh Linnell and Flansburgh choose to get across there are very irreverent points and scenes as well like you know one of the silliest songs in the album is Santa's Beard and I'm not going to hear be here to like make a case for it being you know a low-key and actually devastating song about you know uh heartbreak or whatever but you can read it through the lens you can see beneath the surface of the silliness to you know, a real actual emotion, which is kind of be like powerful, you know, envy and jealousy beneath that. Especially because it comes after I've Got a Match, one of the most like powerfully devastating songs on the record. Yeah, yeah. Like, just like you have this like very like, like actually like really heartbreaking song about a relationship that's gone bad. And then it's just like, hey, like I'm getting cucked by Santa Claus. Well, yeah, and even like, they have this yeah. it's not even just sequencing but it's also like within a particular lyric or idea there can be like both devastation and sheer absurdity like that lyric of yeah. i've got to match your embrace of my collapse is like a play on words of uh the sort of you know the saying that you know i've got to match your face in my ass like you know <laughs> the kind of and, you, know, you know an insult basically yeah. and and the the cadence of that insult is here turned into something that's like that keeps the you know the 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 the, the same structure and even a lot of the same sort of like sounds the ace and apps um sounds but completely just turns it into something that has the entirely opposite emotional effect that's yeah. really clever wordplay and it makes a lot of sense to me that that would be something you would just completely fall for jay because it's, oh, it's the same God, kind yeah. of attention to the power of words and of word construction that you know that i know that you love and and find really funny so i, I do too yeah, this this record is filled to the brim with puns and again like like that was Linnell's thing when he was younger he would listen to like a lot of comedy records and like kind of or a lot of records that had different puns or whatnot like uh, one of my favorites or this is a flan song but like uh, one of the thesis statements of the whole record comes on uh the track the world address which is a sad pun that reflects a sadder mess and i'm like yeah that's kind of the whole basis of the song which is like like uh, because every song is funny in a way but also every song has like in like you said like very quiet devastation or whatnot because like the world's address is like uh, again another like very potent breakup song but he's like trying to laugh his way through it yeah Um, i mean there's like that's a great song uh from a lyrical standpoint because there's like layers of puns throughout the verses of that song and even back into the title of the song as well and flansburg continue continually like finds a new way to invoke a different way of reading the those three words the world's address and 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 it's you know it's a a, a song about heartbreak obviously but like it's a song about uh how like simultaneously incredibly isolating you know on a cosmic scale being heartbreaking can be even if it's like one of the great unifiers of the human experience it's and that's one of my like that's like probably one of my least favorite songs on the whole album and i think it's great because there's so much (laughs) um character and thought and depth in what the song is doing lyrically even the songs on here that could be considered filler tracks, I always find myself playing over and over again. Mm-hmm. You know, tracks like, or You'll Miss Me, which uh, I, I believe is the Tom Waits song of the record. He's doing, I, I always thought he was doing a Tom Waits impression with the, uh, you miss me. He kind of sounds a little bit like Tom Waits, but he also, he sounds a little bit more like Gene Ween doing Tom Waits. <laughs> like it's got that real uh, early, real early Wayne's era energy where like they would be just be doing voices like that. Uh, for whole songs fat, fat like on god wins satan and, and that kind fat, of imp- fat lady. even though you'll miss me is probably like my least favorite song here i still have that connection to a thing that it reminds me of that i really like that endears me to it a little bit 
um yeah. yeah i mean we could <laughs> let's start by talking about the big songs we've already talked about anna and yeah, yeah let's, let's talk about that. the big songs and then we can talk about some of the deep cuts that are you know maybe a little bit easier to overlook but have you know real grit to them like i want to talk about yeah. where your eyes don't go for a minute like this song oh fuck yes this is one of the greatest they might be giant songs hands down it's I think Neil Gaiman himself called it the scariest song he had ever heard. Uh, because like, the, like uh, it was based off of an actual nightmare that John Linnell had as a kid where like he would just walk, like he would just be walking and this fucking like terrifying scarecrow would be following him. And he, and through this song, he relates it to the goddamn like human experience and like of just like, you know, like having basically an anxiety attack, just like mm -hmm. every time you think it's done, oh no, it's like right around the corner waiting for you to show up, like waiting to show up, waiting for you to just like, you know, make yourself look stupid by like having this panic attack in public or whatnot. Yeah. But at least that's my interpretation of it. Absolutely. I mean, Linnell does a very similar thing on the verses here as to what he does on Anna Ang, when you have lyrics that kind of run on and end in a slightly like, Un, not conventionally kind of correct place for emphasis but still like for instance every jumble pile of person has a thinking part that wonders what the part that isn't thinking isn't thinking of that that's my favorite line like he he actually i, I can't think of many examples off the top of my head but i know they exist where he will end a lot of lines with like um with prepositions or conjunctions like in places where the lines shouldn't end grammatically um, but it, it just adds this extra level of kind of discombobulation to it that you have to kind of go back and again sort of unpack what you've just heard. And again, in the context yeah. of a song that is about anxiety and confusion, that works beautifully. And I love the next lyric as well. Yeah. Should you worry when the skull head is in front of you or is it worse because it's always waiting where your eyes don't go? That's I always would think about that song because I remember listening to this record, like to, to get into what this record kind of means to me personally. I listen. I was going through... Uh, when I when I was listening, that was the worst goddamn summer of my life, and uh, like where like shit just kept piling up, and this this album like where your eyes don't go became sort of a personal anthem because it felt like every day like new shit or new emotions would just kind of wake up, and then I'm just like oh shit like something's ahead of me, but then the, this fucking like flaming skull head is about to like wait for me. And yeah. so like where your eyes don't go. And there's a moment in the bridge where it samples that old nursery rhyme. Someone's in the kitchen with, yeah. uh, who is it? Someone? Yeah. I yeah. It, and yeah. Uh, it, 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 it uh, kind of goes back to that sort of like childlike fear of like, you know, Linnell having this uh, when he was a kid, like having this nightmare when he was a kid. Uh, yeah. That, so yeah, where your eyes don't go is a fucking amazing song. <laughs> and uh, I, I love that guy, how it ends too, that, that guitar outro from Flans, like just, and like the little, oh, 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 oh. I, I was going to say, I think musically, this is one of the best songs on the record, just on that pure level. There's like always so much going on and uh, the way that that song, you know, the intensity of the, of the instrumentation and the complexity of the way that these little melodic lines are just kind of continuing and weaving around each other. It's almost kind of solo -y at the end there it's so good it's it, it's just fantastic yeah. i love that shit so much but not as much right. as i love my second favorite song on this album uh behind anna Ang, of course which is they'll need a crane another one of the big singles on this album we yes. have to talk about this song yes. this is i think you know again paired with anna Ang, and again i have i don't have remote i've only heard the first thing three might be i've only heard the first three they might be Giants album, so I've still got some more listening to do. But to me, I think this might be the pinnacle of Linnell's lyricism. Just it's not only there. in the it sense that that it's um, you know emotionally devastating song, but also just there's so much care and complexity in the way that these lines are constructed. The internal rhymes in these in these lyrics are amazing. Lad's gal is all he has. Gal's gladness hangs upon the love of lad, the love of lad. Some things Gal says to lad aren't meant as bad, but cause a little pain. Like they cause that, him pain. The, the the internal rhyming there is so good. It's so just unnecessarily extra. It's a little bit Dr. Zeus y, which I love. <laughs> like, uh, and and that little, you know, again, it's that people call they might be giants like childlike or childish music. And I think what they mean is that there's a lot of, you know 
techniques not only disregarding the way that all the music sounds which can very much evoke novelty music and all that sort of stuff but there is a lot of techniques that are used in lyrical construction and in vocal delivery that i think evoke things like nursery rhymes or like the you know things like you know dr zeus for instance or or that kind of um approach to creating really sort of catchy and simplistic repeating motifs and they'll need a crane uses that skill to just devastating effect as well just the continually kind of it's repeated to the point of you know of just feeling like nauseating and when you have that repetition being used to just hammer home lines like they'll need a crane to take the house he built for her apart it's going to take a metal ball hung from a chain to pick up they'll need a crane to pick up the broken ruins again um, oh, and this the, one of the best little uh, sec- verses or sections or bridges or whatever in the whole album. I yes, love. Yes, I know what you're talking Smith about. Part here where he's like, "Don't call me at work again. The boss still hates me. I'm just tired and I don't love you anymore." And there's a restaurant we should check out where the other nightmare people like to go. I mean, nice people, baby. Wait, I didn't mean to say nightmare. I love that shit because he glances over like, "I don't love you anymore." Like yeah. that's such a quietly devastating moment. Like because again, like. Uh, to go into the history of this track, I remember somebody in this documentary had saying that it was about John Linnell's parents, that like this was about, uh, that this was basically about an old married couple mm. who was basically just like kind of living like, you know, like the most basic uh, emotions every day or the most basic actions and whatnot. Mm. And they've just like completely fallen out of love with each other. And yeah. like the, the the moments that that they reveal to each other aren't like in the big statements, but in just what they do and whatnot like when he accidentally says nightmare people instead of like other people or what yeah <laughs> nice people like i think that couplet of i'm just tired i don't love you anymore and there's a restaurant where you should check out is like exactly what you're saying in two lines right yeah. there just that that mundanity of that experience that's set in over years and years and years that you know means that great emotional revelations are as mundane as you know planning dinner or whatever and it's just it's just a great it's a great song it'll resonate with anyone whose parents have been through a divorce or who has maybe been in the situation themselves but yeah (laughs) i and i i think again there's a little bit of subtle profundity that could be so easy to overlook in a line like love sees love's happiness but happiness can't see that love is sad like that seems really simple on the face of it it seems that it's just conveying like you know the inability of one person to truly see another but you know there's there's the way that the emotions themselves are anthropomorphized and that lyric as well just lends at this extra level of of i think psychological kind of complexity to the way in which it's not just that we can't you know understand each other on an empathetic level but that our emotions can be complicated and can have their own lives within our psyches that you know it's just really clever (laughs) stuff and yeah you know i like any time that um one of the johns like anthropomorphizes a feeling or an inanimate object or a thing that usually ends up being really really devastating and really clever uh oh 100 percent. and that's absolutely a theme that continues all throughout their discography up until their most recent stuff Mm -hmm. and i think that's why like a lot of them like i when i first got into this band i think that was one of the things that I first like, you know, associate and loved about them, like about how like birdhouse in your soul is off a flood is about a literal nightlight or even, or even later, like they would write songs about like, um, about brontosauruses or whatnot. And like, you know, kind of like, you know, like summing up the human experience, experience just with these, like, you know, again, like anthropomorphizations or like, you know, or, or just like objects or whatnot. And one of my favorite tracks on here that also has like these, this, uh, this moment of like human experience that really, really speaks to me and whatnot is Flan, arguably Flans' best moment of songwriting ever, uh, or at least in, in this decade, it was us. Uh, it's snowball and hell. Oh, I'm so. I was going to bring that song up next as well. That's, that's my. That's my third. Secretly, song one of the song. greatest tracks on here. This penultimate track, it's like so right good. before again, "Kiss Me, Son of God," which is also considered to be one of the best tracks on the record. But "Snowball and Hell" details my favorite John Flansburg lyrical topic, which is I 
my I want to kill my fucking boss because I hate my goddamn job. <laughs> like he's kind of uh, like that's like a like songs like Hearing Aid Off a Flood or Put Your Hand Inside a Puppet Head on the, the self titled really also emphasize that as well. But to to me, Snowball in Hell is kind of the the best the best example of it because that's also a song about mundanity, just living your life like as you were and you're trying to. Uh, you're like just trying to live your life in the most mundane fashion possible. And I love that little sample on the bridge, which is just like these two guys who are like, you know, like just like, I'm guessing having a water cooler discussion or like a discussion over a cup of coffee, just like, oh yeah, um, you're back at that old time is money kick, right? Yeah, Not back on it, Joe, it, still on it. It's so like- Just these like total of, robots of yeah, human it, beings. And now he's- like trying not to become one, but he's he he has failed. He is now basically a cog in the working machine, and yeah. it has that like beautiful little like accordion moment. Like the the the, the main melody of the song really gets me too, or the little glockenspiel. Like it it's it just sounds so like beautifully sad. Uh, like even though the song is about a mundane existence, this song is not mundane in the slightest. Uh, I love this goddamn song. No, I agree. It's my third favorite on the record behind the two I've, you know, the two big ones I've already mentioned. It's, it's just, yeah, I, like, obviously I don't think Flans, at least, you know, in my experience has, or a penchant for the same level of like intense complexity and, you know, inner rhyme schemes, all that sort of stuff that uh, Linnell has, but it's just an, a perfect little song about like what you said about the kind of the mundanity of, of working and, it is there's the shuffle of the drums in the song as well that's kind of like relentless kind of plodding that i absolutely love the sense of of moving forward but going nowhere i think is fantastic yeah oh that's a good that's a good uh, way of putting um, that and and you know you have songs on here as well that are you know unless i'm you know interpreting it wrong or maybe are about some topics that are a little bit further afield as well like pencil rain for instance this is is this a war mm. song or is the war just a okay metaphor in this song i can't quite interpret it it seems to be like a song about you know people sort of being sent to you know people countrymen being sent away to die and all that sort of thing and but i don't i can't tell if that is a metaphor or not it's a really fascinating song see neither can i and i love this band so much but like uh I, some like sometimes again their lyrics can be so literal that i am just imagining just a bunch of people just hauling giant ass pencils with each like with each other another big part of this band is that they will often parody musical elements. So this song in particular is a Prince parody, Pencil Rain, Rain, Purple Rain. Uh, (laughs) uh, And I guess just like kind of like, like, you know, having this like big, like marching war song about like everybody lobbing each other with pencils instead of bullet fire, I think. I just just got it. It's just a funny I just got it. I literally right now, as you were talking about, it, I just got like the the wordplay. Like it is a song about war, and you know it's a yeah. song about where you know. And this is obvious enough when you listen to it that obviously the pencils represent kind of like shrapnel and bullets that kind of rain down on um, yeah, these soldiers. But yeah, I only just got like the pencil lead, but the and also the lead of you know of um, you know artillery fire and and bullets and that sort of thing. The the lead is the reason why this. <laughs> uh pun works i didn't get that yeah, i was exactly. just like yeah pencils sure um <laughs> that's really clever no, that's... <laughs> and, and then, to know, go and back to the devastating in the final verse of the song yeah. as well now hear the roar that none can ignore the thunderous clatter of splintering wood and the lives that are claimed and none who've witnessed all can speak of a nobler cause than perishing in the pers- pencil rain like that's it's a brutal but inevitable conclusion to the song and yeah. it's funny how that, you know, he, he can ring that level of genuine emotional intensity and kind of real, real gravitas out of a song that is essentially just making one of the most dumb bits of punny wordplay that I could possibly imagine, yeah. you know, to mock Layers. Prince of all things. Well, speaking of Prince comparisons, uh, one of the album's leading singles, Purple Toupee, again, is a bit of a, was inspired by Raspberry Beret with the uh, with the chorus. Yeah. And again, like, uh, to kind of, to talk about the meaning of this song, again, like, something, like, like, you listen, you look at this title and it sounds so stupid, and yet it's making fun of all of these 
boomer types, like, you know, who were like, you know, these like said that they were gonna lead the revolution all throughout the 60s. And they're gonna like, you know, bring bring down the government like during times of war and, you know, like uh, civil rights and whatnot. And then like 20 years later, they're just like up on Wall Street, just these absolute yuppie types, like who have just done absolutely nothing that have given into that sort of corporate machine. Like yeah. the purple toupee in this case is of course supposed to represent a college diploma. That's what the gold lame is too. And um, you have those uh, um, those moments too, where it's like, a, again, like that lyric, I shout out free the Expo 67 till they stepped on my head and they told me I was fat. Now I'm very big, I'm a big important man. <laughs> and they, like, yeah, it's like that whole, like which sums up the boomer movement to an extent. Yeah, yeah. like I just-, I, just I love that. I love to... that kind of, um, you know, sort of really sharply written satire that's also at the same time kind of almost juvenile, has an almost juvenile sense of humor as well. Like there's gravity and there's real kind of depth to the root of what the satire is about, but it is mm. not like, it doesn't succumb to, you know, that kind of portent and in, in that pursuit. It still stays a really irreverent and silly song that makes a, a lot of really dumb jokes. Uh, and I love it. It's It's fantastic. It's also just like fucking like a banger of a track, like the whole... Like, especially like what I, what I interpret the, like, of course, like the drums are fucking great. And I love, love that melody. Again, when you're cribbing from Prince, of course, the melody is going to be fucking fantastic. And then, but I love the, uh, the little opening, like marching beat at the beginning, especially because they like, one of the jokes is um, somebody put their fingers in the president's ear. And, and they came back with uh, Johnson's Wax. Johnson's uh, Wax, one of the best fucking puns on the record. That's but really also, good. The, the, like, uh, the, books, the book depository, or book suppository from Cuba, like, uh, especially, that's a reference to, of course, the uh, the candy assassination. And, like, that's why I interpreted the opening, like, two beats of the, sh the song to be, like, the, the two bullets that went into Kennedy. Yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's a good, that's a really good bit of, like, onomatopoeia. I hadn't even thought of that. That's so good. Um, that yeah, yeah again, and, so much cleverness. Uh, and it's never like again, like I, I think um like some detractors of this band have said that they maybe are like they're they're too clever for their own good. And I'm just like, I I never got that sort of uh that sort of like criticism about this band because again, like I find these songs to A be very funny, but also incredibly human. I and I think um, like they're kind of like in in a sense uh, because like the band that they often get most compared to, especially especially like uh, with similar fans of them, is Ween. Uh, Gene Ween has said himself he is hate he hates being compared to They Might Be Giants, and it, like uh, because quote they're more like anal college types and we're more like scumbags. Yeah, that, there's some truth to that as well. I think when you think about the kind of stereotypical image you would associate of Ween and they might be Giants listeners. I mean, to me, I could see how someone approaching, you know, who's fairly new to this music might make that comparison. But I think that what Gene is commenting on there, that to me reflects how I think of these two bands in association to each other, which is, you know, this kind of contrast. Yeah, they're both irreverent and silly and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, you're right. They might be giants of the kind of like college graduates and, you know, because there's so much, you know, satire and, and depth and wit and all that sort of stuff in these songs. And, you know, we are, you know, the dropouts, the, the layabouts. The, and of course, those are the stereotypes. And then the the more you interrogate both bands, the more you can see counter examples within their music, like songs of oh, the absolutely. giants that are as stupid and silly as the, as the stereotypical like, ween song and ween songs that have a level of depth that. You oh, know, God, yeah. Specific. So it's it's an interesting little bit of stereotyping, but I, I do think it speaks to how most people will encounter both of these bands respectively, and also belies the fact that the more time you give to each of these bands, the more depth and variation and complexity to what they are about you will find. And I think yeah. that's super true with They Might Be Giants and Ween, is that you know, my first impression of They Might Be Giants novelty kind of silly joke band i'm sure they have a couple of amazing songs but then the more i spent the more time i spent with their albums and particularly with this one which was the real skeleton key the more i kind of got how that aspect of what they do is always kind of complemented by and in conversation with something that is much more but more than that and and you're more about and more kind of enamored with the power of great songwriting 
Absolutely. And uh, another song, I guess I just wanted to mention too, mm -hmm. uh, one of their more, uh, like <laughs> every time like this band also like write, like tries to write a sad song as well. Like it, it always ends up being so funny, like on Piece of Dirt, I, the line, yeah. um, like, like again, like, which sounds like, you know, this like sea shanty, like, especially with the accordions, like somebody going out to sea and is just desperately alone. And then the lyric, I would climb the highest mountain just to jump into a fountain. Yeah. Which is like such a weird image. I mean, like, like, like uh, especially with the way like you would just splatter yourself and whatnot if that happened. But I don't know. yeah, <laughs> it's that. I mean, what, what a glorious deep cut this is. This is an amazing yeah. song that is so easy to overlook considering all that surrounds it. But man, this song just hits like a ton of bricks. Some of the most devastating lyricism on the entire record, I think. Like, it's a, 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 this is a Flans song, right? So this is Flans, yeah. I think this actually might be my favorite uh, song of his from a songwriting oh, perspective. Yeah. I, I just, I love yeah. the, yeah, it's a very simple song. It's about a very, very simple thing. It's about isolation. It's about thinking about your place in the world. It's about you know, how you deal with and reckon with your loneliness and how that loneliness itself interacts with the world that you live in and the state that you live in and that sort of thing. Yeah. And I just love the lyric. Um, a woman's voice on the radio can convince you you're in love. A woman's yes. voice on the telephone can convince you you're alone. But I set my sails so long ago, they've revoked my sailor's badge. Said I should be content and happy on this ink spot where I stand. I love that, that piece of dirt. Oh, that ink spot where I stand too. Just like that perfect metaphor for like, you know, writing your thoughts on a diary or something. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. God, yeah. There's great little lyrical analogs throughout these songs as well one a deep cut that really stands out to me is, is a song that's kind of a little bit silly but has like cushioned into it some of the most like just devastating lines you've ever heard is well specifically one of the most devastating lines i've ever heard is in the song shoehorn with teeth uh, which actually yes. actually this particular line is probably my favorite lyric on the entire album uh which is he asks the girl if they can both sit in a chair but he doesn't get nervous she's not really there like the, the more I've thought about that, the more it's kind of just fucked me up internally. It's, it's, I don't even want to go there. It's just a really devastating line. In the context of a song that's kind of throwaway based on a prank that a friend of theirs used to do, where, where yeah. they would kind of waste the time of a shoe store owner by trying to demand this shoehorn with teeth that doesn't exist. Um, and, you know. <laughs> The, the just it's got this real rambunctious kind of prankster energy to it the song as well just musically and how the lines are delivered mm. you know people should get beat up for stating their beliefs in their beliefs it's got that real uh, sort of like mad magazines kind of sh sticky energy to it that i love and then you just have that line about the girl who isn't there and wanting to sit with her in the chair is just uh. yeah uh. <laughs> The, the lyric there is a similar lyric on that song that has fucked me up which is like again like again this silly goof off song has a line like what's the sash and never think about the tomb when you're much too busy returning to the womb yeah that that like, sense of just um your your brain and your heart being kind of fleeing in different directions from one another and both of them being regret being sort of regressing or missing the forest for the trees in some way you know it's it's a it's a profound little observation cushioned in an absolutely incomprehensibly silly song that you know has no real deeper meaning to it except for in these occasional moments that 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 is that's the kind of surrealist absurdity that i love it, it and it's not often and not always done with that level of eloquence and you know uh lack of pretension i guess i would say yeah. but yeah it's it's just so much everything on this record is great I have a story of that that track. If you want to hear it, um, Go ahead. when I when I saw these guys live, I was uh, like, uh, what happened was that like they were playing their set, and then um, and then Flames says to the microphone, like, okay, so next up for this next song, you're not allowed to have your phones out, and we're like, what? Why? Like, what? What's happening? Because uh, and they bring out okay, because the, the story with Shoehorn with Teeth live is that. They used to play it like, you know, live. They would chuck out this like giant fucking glockenspiel and they would play shoehorn with teeth and they would do the, uh, 
like he, he wants a shoehorn, the kind with teeth, but up, but and they would just do that ding. They would bring out this whole Glockenspiel just to do the ding, like that one little ding. And then they retired the bit in like 2002. And then 16 years later, they bring out this giant fucking Glockenspiel <laughs> and the entire crowd just went fucking insane. We were all like, uh, me too. And then like, somebody did get a picture of it and part of it was because like they wanted it to be a surprise because mm -hmm. they were doing a new year's show the next day and they were just kind of like testing that out to see how the crowd would react to it and all i know is that like we were all laughing our asses off the minute they just bring out that glockenshield just to do the ding i love it's, this fucking band i love that that's an amazing story and yeah i mean yeah, and that's basically the gist of it. I mean, that that is that is they might be giants. Yeah. That is Lincoln. I mean, we've there's we haven't talked about every single track, but um, is there any other songs that you want to in particular shout out or that means something to you uh, in particular before we wrap this up? I will shout out the uh, the last track, which is um, "Kiss Me, Son of God," which is like the perfect kind of like little bow to wrap on top of this whole thing, because. Um, I think like uh, if you were to like, you know, kind of analyze They Might Be Giants for like just from a surface level or what may, you may know about them in the past. I don't know if like uh, at first you would ever call them a political band or whatnot or like one that like dabbles in political satire or whatnot. And yet Kiss Me Son of God is, even though it's a unit, it can be like about basically anybody from like a leader of a country to just some asshole that you, you don't like that lives down the street or whatnot like but like the way this song like is like has the sort of detail which is just like you know selling your like basically selling out the working people just to you know make a just to make a few bucks or just to like get farther in politics this this album like like this and uh the self-titled kind of came out during like the peak of the reagan administration so it's not hard and because of like you know the critiques of that sort of like capitalist mindset like you gotta like go 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 in order to like get that money and like soon the money will trickle down to you uh mm -hmm kiss me it, it's not hard to see like you know kiss me son of god as being like this direct attack on like the reagan administration as well as of course that line i look like jesus so they say but mr jesus is very far away of course yeah. like kind of parodying that sort of like christian conservative mindset yeah and the, the um, hypocrisy that's there and like how you know that particular you know reagan era republicanism and beyond are so aligned yeah. with you know christian values despite being you know you know committing heinous acts uh yeah and then mm -hmm. if, yeah it's it's a it's again like purple to pay it's another kind of really ruthless um satirical song as well but it's it's so different and such a stark and, and beautiful way of ending the record as well because musically it's just so distinct from oh, it's perfect it's so lush and pretty yeah. and mostly devoid of the kind of like staccato musical stylings and you know the chintzier aesthetics of the other stuff on the record it's just it's this really lush and vibrant ending to the album that still is laced with this almost basically venomous you know uh, sensibility to it they're almost crooning and that's what i love about that track like kind of like meshing together that sort of like very sweet lovely vocal melody and technique versus again that's sort of like you know very direct uh sort of satire mm -hmm. and if i may just say one last thing about this band like in terms of what they mean to me and whatnot like when i first heard this band all i knew like in high school in elementary school all i knew were their children's stuff uh because like or i didn't listen to them or i was like only familiar with their children's works because they sort of had a second career revival in the 2000s because of their children's albums and i and as a result i thought oh they're just a children's band and then when i started getting more and more into them it was because i had friends who really liked this band and i saw open and i was getting into open mike eagle and he called this band the best band in the world and i was like okay well i, I guess i gotta listen to them now and then suddenly i just became like so suddenly enamored with them and their music and the way they write and like again like part of like why i like you know have like that sort of special connection they basically helped me through the worst year of my life 
and uh, like listening to listening to their albums, like because of the way they would write, just like really, really spoke to me at the time and, and still to this day. And when I saw them live and I heard Anna Ang, my favorite song, the song that I played most uh, out of all of them, it felt like like they did that for the encore and it felt like running a victory lap. Mm. I love this band more than life itself. Well, let us know at home, anyone who's watching, anyone who's listening, what you think of They Might Be Giants, what They Might Be Giants means to you and what you think of Lincoln as well, where Lincoln would fall in your They Might Be Giants ranking as well as your favorite record of theirs. Is it not? What are your favorite songs? What are your favorite deep cuts? What did you think of our very admittedly rushed but fun conversation? We want to hear from you <laughs> in the comments below. Let us know what you think of this album. If you enjoyed this conversation, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel if you want to. Of course, if you want to see more of this, we do these kinds of conversations, these kinds of reviews every single week, and it's a lot of fun. So we hope you'll join us too if you want to go above and beyond and support us directly you can hit the join button for just one dollar a month become a member of the jams t family get your name credited in the title crawl of every video on this channel plus if you want to recommend us some music to listen to and talk about your recommendation will go to the top of the pile as always though folks until next time rock over london rock on chicago holiday in pleasing people all over the world